modern birds have not always existed. Um, there were no birds at all prior to the Mesozoic era, the age of dinosaurs, and birds evolved from dinosaurs by the middle of that era. The birds of the Cretaceous were not the birds which we had today. Many still had teeth and claws on their fingers. When the dinosaurs became extinct, um, the great family tree of modern birds had uh, just begun uh, to divide into different branches, like its early branch, which would lead to birds like ostriches and rheas alive today, um, the chicken and duck branch, um, which would be the next most basal group, uh, a number of aquatic bird uh, lineages, um, and then uh, partway through the last 65 million years, uh, which is the Cenozoic era, the age of mammals, quote. Um, then the uh, final big group of birds had uh, separated, known as uh, the order Passeriformes, the passerine uh, birds. And so uh, these are known as the songbirds. And just to point out that this is the most recent uh, group of um, uh, of birds uh, of uh, the modern groups alive today. So not only did most of Earth's history occur without any birds, certainly most of the history of birds occurred without songbirds. They were the last group to evolve. And they did so in stages, the birds in this order. And before there are the uh, songbirds in our era, the Ossine passeriforms, there was another group called the sub -Ossine. Now, uh, this group is very common in other areas, such as South America. Um, uh, so many of uh, these are uh, brownish uh, in color. Uh, many make um, uh, 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 ornate uh, uh, ovens as uh, as uh, places uh, for uh, nests, and so there are uh, a variety of uh, these. Um, but one group, you know, worth mentioning, are the tyrant flycatchers. They're called tyrant flycatchers. Um, because uh, even though they're small, uh, these birds can attack larger birds to chase them off of, uh, you know, their uh, territory. And there are a variety of these in, um, for example, South America. They are extremely common, and some are very colorful. So here, here we see uh, long tail feathers here, um, but there are uh, ones which have, you know, very brilliant um, uh, colors. Uh, so there's a, a great uh, diversity. Um, in our area, uh, we also then have um, uh, tyrant uh, uh, flycatchers. So, for example, the kingbird, um, it uh, can often be observed um, chasing after larger birds, you know, even birds like herons and eagles, which are many times its size, to harass them out of its territory. So the name tyrant uh, flycatcher uh, certainly um, is applicable to these birds. Um, while many of the ones in South America are quite uh, colorful and brightly colored, the ones in our area have a, uh, you know, a driver color. So here is a, um, a flycatcher uh, from uh, South uh, America. Uh, here is another one. So notice that they can uh, be brightly colored. Um, but here is the Eastern Kingbird in our uh, area. Uh, so once again, uh, more drab and color. It's a flycatcher. So uh, uh, depending on insects um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, survive, and once again, uh, capable of chasing other uh, animals uh, or uh, other birds, uh, uh, other birds uh, away. Uh, there are other tyrant flycatchers in our area, which are you know drab in color, such as phoebes and uh, peewees, often a gray color. Uh, so in the great order Passeriformes, which has the majority of birds alive today, there's a group known as the sub which include tyrant flycatchers, including uh, some we have here um, uh, uh, today. Now, uh, the Passeriformes, especially uh, the more advanced uh, Ossine Passeriformes, uh, they are small, uh, they are often colorful, and they are often quite musical um, uh, because of a modification of their trachea known as the syrinx. And so when you listen to birds which are not in this group, uh, such as herons or eagles, 
uh, or uh, ducks. They are not overly musical uh, in their song, but it was the modification of the respiratory system uh, uh, forming a syrinx where the trachea uh, branches. Uh, this is what makes uh, this group uh, so uh, musical. Um, and uh, so if we were to then give a survey of the, uh, uh, the passerine birds in our area, this would be you know, a, a long uh, discussion. I wanna hit you know, some highlights and, and mention some of these groups, um, but these small songbirds, they are the majority of uh, birds uh, alive uh, today. Uh, and so this would include uh, swallows, and we have a number of swallows in our area. Uh, the most colorful of which is the barn swallow. Uh, these are often uh, seen uh, you know, on telephone lines and near human habitations, you know, getting the name barn swallow uh, because of their habit of uh, you know, lit nesting in uh, barns. But there are then also uh, swallows as well. There are tree swallows and cliff uh, swallows, which you know, aren't quite as colorful uh, given that barn swallows have an orange color. Um, here you can see um, you know, more uh, white and then a uh, dark gray or kind of a metallic um, blue uh, in uh, color. And so uh, we have a variety of swallows and they're very important in uh, flying and uh, you know, keeping insect uh, populations uh, in uh, control. Um, so uh, the uh, suborder of uh, passeriforms can be subdivided into uh, many uh, groups. Um, I'm just going to hit some. Uh, the horned lark is most likely to be seen in our area uh, in uh, winter. Uh, and so once again, uh, there are uh, birds which utilize the habitat of the Northeast United States, um, but uh, how they, uh, uh, they uh, uh, utilize it uh, can vary. In some, this uh, is a territory for living all year round. Uh, for some, uh, this is uh, only their summer grounds. Uh, in uh, others, uh, uh, this is actually where they live in winter and they occur farther north. Um, crows are rather large members of this group. Most of the songbirds are far smaller uh, than crows. And crows have an omnivorous uh, diet. So crows and their larger cousins, the ravens, they can even feed on things like chipmunks and eggs um, and, uh, and carrion. Uh, so they can uh, be uh, large, uh, feed on larger items. And here you see a large uh, flock of uh, crows during um, the migration uh, in uh, late autumn uh, here in Orange uh, County. And so you know, they uh, can travel in uh, large uh, numbers. There are different types of crows. So there is the common crow and the fish crow, both of which occur in our area, uh, which uh, can um, be distinguished by their song. So even though they visually look alike, they can distinguish between each other um, by the way that they sound. Uh, uh, there are a number of uh, pastoring birds which can spend a whole year here, such as chickadees. Uh, and so um, these are small birds. Uh, feeding uh, on a variety of things, including seeds and other uh, plant uh, uh, material. And so they would be common visitors uh, to uh, bird feeders. And once again, if you had a bird feeder in winter, one could see chickadees uh, throughout uh, the entire uh, winter. As uh, uh, the same would be true of nut hatches, which have a kind of a bluish uh, gray uh, uh, color. Um, there are two types of uh, nut hatches. This is the red-breasted uh, nut hatch, um, uh, which is the lesser um, uh, nut hatch in our area. I think I might have skipped. Uh, so here's uh, a nut hatch. I think uh, let me just zip back one video. Here is the more common uh, nut hatch. Um, now, nut hatches are interesting because here you can see um, uh, that they, uh, while many uh, birds uh, can go up a tree, I notice that they uh, are capable of going uh, both up and down. Uh, most birds can't do that. So we say uh, woodpeckers, uh, for uh, example. And so uh, nut hatches, uh, that's you know, one of 
you know, their uh, abilities, once again, likely to be found all year round. And there are different species of nuthatch. Once again, here's that red-breasted uh, nuthatch. Uh, the tufted titmouse can be found uh, throughout the year. It is noticeable with the tuft of feathers on uh, the top of its uh, head, and it is quite musical. And so in early spring, uh, its calls are very commonly, uh, 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 very commonly uh, heard. So once again, the tufted uh, titmouse. In uh, this group, you can see the, the tuft of uh, feathers on uh, its, uh, its head. Um, uh, we'll get to the more colorful ones in just a, a second. Um, but uh, these passerine birds, not all of them are brightly colored. So there are a variety of wrens. Uh, and wrens uh, are very often, you know, quite uh, musical, as near the end here. Colder than normal winters can kill Carolina wrens as far south as Maryland. Broods for the year. Okay. Colder than normal, two broods per year. Um, and then uh, here's the normal winters. It's so Carolina. I apologize. Myself. Zooming on videos slow each slow down the other. And this is how would you stop? Um, gnat catchers are small um, uh, passer forms, uh, which we can see here. Uh, and um, once again, uh, the great modification of this uh, group, in, in addition to the smaller size. Uh, was the modification of uh, the syrinx, and here is uh, a, a bird with a, a you know a brown uh, color to allow it to camouflage, known as the thrasher. Um, but when uh, you listen to its uh, call, it has a quite varied call, and no bird outside uh, the passerine group would be able to uh, have this uh, vocal repertoire. Um, uh, catbirds are in this group, a gray color, although they do have an auburn patch uh, underneath uh, their uh, tail. Um, many uh, passerine birds uh, can feed on a variety of things, but uh, help to keep insect uh, populations in uh, control. Uh, mockingbirds uh, get their name because of the a great variety of songs uh, that they are capable of. And so uh, if you were listening, you know, they might uh, seem like other birds. Uh, I would, you know, have a great variety of songs. Most uh, birds have a, a narrower a range of, um, uh, of uh, songs. Um, and there are a variety of thrushes which live in our area. They very often have very flute-like uh, sounds uh, in the cases of the uh, wood thrush and hermit uh, thrush. Uh, another cousin of theirs, uh, the viri, uh, has a, a warbling uh, sound to them. Uh, these are generally more brownish in uh, color. Um, uh, but there are two uh, noteworthy uh, uh, thrushes. Um, and so the robin is a thrush and it's a bright orange uh, uh, you know, chest and makes it easily visible compared to the, uh, the thrushes that uh, you've uh, just seen, such as this wood thrush and the viri, uh, which then can easily, um, uh, can easily uh, camouflage um, because of uh, you know, their more drab uh, coloration. Uh, robins and also bluebirds are uh, thrushes. So here you can hear the very flute-like call of thrushes. Uh, once again, uh, bluebirds are uh, more colorful uh, uh, thrushes. Bluebirds were once much more common uh, in our area as were warblers. 
uh, today, uh, much of their ecological niche has been taken over by things like starlings and the, um, uh, the house sparrow. Um, but these were introduced from uh, Europe, so they are invasive species. So uh, the forests of North America were once far more colorful than they are uh, today. While bluebirds can migrate, they can uh, stay in our area throughout uh, the winter, especially as winters become more mild uh, due to climate change. Uh, once again, uh, the robins, which are often a harbinger of early spring as they migrate uh, back in uh, flocks, are easily recognized with their orange uh, chest. Um, and they're often seen in grass uh, where uh, they feed um, on a number of uh, invertebrates such as earthworms. And so after, uh, say, you know, a rain when earthworms are uh, closer to the surface, uh, robins uh, do a great deal of uh, feeding. And as they uh, feed in early uh, in spring, this helps those which are migrating further north um, uh, to reach uh, their destination. Um, as I you know, just kind of survey a number of the other uh, passerine uh, birds, as some are very musical, and this would include a group known as the uh, vireos, um, uh, which are uh, related to uh, the warblers, also very uh, uh, musical. And, and so uh, with a lot of the videos that I'm quickly going through here, you can hear the birds calling in, uh, in the background. So there are a number of kinds of vireo in our uh, area, including the solitary vireo. That's one of uh, our uh, vireos. There are uh, a number of them. Um, another uh, group of uh, birds in uh, the passerine uh, order uh, are the blackbirds. Uh, Red-winged blackbirds are uh, easily recognized because of the bright uh, red and yellow uh, bands uh, which uh, males possess on their wings. Uh, females are more drably um, uh, uh, colored and uh, they are you know, prominently calling, especially in swampy areas, uh, which is their primary habitat. So if you were to spend you know, time in a wetland, uh, one would probably see uh, red-winged blackbirds, uh, particularly the males uh, calling uh, the females, would be more uh, secretive, um, especially when there were nests. One of the blackbirds, which uh, unfortunately has been introduced in this area, is uh, the cowbird. Cowbirds are brood parasites where they can lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. They do not care for their own young. Here you can see the brown head of the males and the females are in the background. Um, and uh, this then uh, means that other bird species are wasting their energy caring for offspring that aren't theirs. But then the young cowbirds can even then eject the actual offspring uh, uh, from the nest, out of the nest, killing them. And so that, uh, you know, these other birds are actually raising uh, the bird that, you know, killed their offspring. Uh, this is serious because uh, cowbirds uh, became introduced into this area once the trees were cut. They aren't a forest bird. They are originally native to uh, Western North America in more open spaces. But as trees were cut, this allowed them to get a foothold uh, here. And so um, many of our native birds uh, are severely decreased in their population um, because of the brood parasitism uh, um, practiced by these uh, cowbirds. So and not only are they invasive to this area, but they decrease the number of native birds. There are other uh, birds, uh, I'm sorry, blackbirds in our area, uh, including uh, bobolinks, uh, where uh, the males I can have bright eye colors, but females and juveniles, you know, a more, uh, you know, a yellowish and more camouflage. But here is a, a male uh, a bobolink. You can see the very obvious um, uh, color there. And then uh, another uh, blackbird in our area uh, are the crackles, uh, whose feathers have more of an iridescent uh, quality uh, uh, to them. Um, Starlings 
uh, were introduced. Um, I apologize, I think I we skipped the crackle. Uh, starlings are common in our area, especially in urban environments, but they are not native to the area. They were introduced, and uh, that means that their abundance means that they have displaced uh, other uh, more native uh, species. Going into other groups of passerine birds, uh, cedar waxwings are another bird uh, which can be recognized by a tuft of feathers on uh, their head. They're very colorful birds. While most of them kind of a cream color, they do have patches of both yellow and uh, red uh, on them. Okay, so cedar waxwings are, uh, you know, rather, uh, you know, at striking uh, birds with uh, their coloration. Um, Baltimore Orioles are uh, common sites and they are very musical in uh, spring. Um, that we could argue about whether uh, the best name for them is the Baltimore Oriole or the Northern Oriole. Sometimes in science, um, there is a dispute where there's more than one name and common usage, uh, but you know, uh, we tend to say that the first name was the most appropriate one. Obviously, the fact that Baltimore Oriole is you know, a popular name, even the name of uh, a baseball team, uh, you know, then uh, makes it problematic. Uh, but the, the more appropriate uh, name would probably be the Northern Oriole. But, you know, this is so, uh, you know, the name Baltimore Oriole is uh, so common. Um, but that has a bright orange color. Um, Scarlet tanagers are deep forest uh, birds. So you need to kind of be in, you know, a, a mature forest to see these, but they have a brilliant scarlet um, uh, color. Uh, this would be one bird that would say suffer from the nest parasitism of cowbirds. And this is why, let's say there's a block of land. Well, the scarlet tanagers, which nest in the forest, would not be vulnerable to nest parasitism given that uh, cowbirds like open areas. But once houses were put into this forest or roads were cut, this would mean that you know what was once a big block of forest is now subdivided with open spaces alongside of the road, et cetera. So that might cause cowbirds to be introduced into the area where they could uh, parasitize uh, this uh, bird. So you know, preserving big blocks of habitat uh, is uh, important. A number of uh, passerine birds have thicker bills, which then mean that they can uh, then feed on seeds, you know, and be able to crush seeds and open uh, a seed. Uh, some of these are known as uh, finches, and we have a couple of kinds of finch uh, which live in our area, such as purple finches, uh, house uh, finches. Um, uh, cardinals uh, are in this group. Uh, you can see the thick uh, bill here. Uh, cardinals are a bird which can spend uh, the winter. So while many birds which feed on insects must migrate south, those which are feeding on seeds, notice the thick bill which would allow them to feed on seeds, they're able to spend all uh, year round. Uh, it is the bright males which have uh, uh, you know, the red color. Uh, females uh, are more easily camouflaged, not quite as re red. And interestingly, um, it is uh, the diet of the uh, cardinal, which allows it to synthesize these red pigments. So females can look at a male and get an idea of how well nourished he is, which may be important information as she decides uh, her mating uh, partners. And so, you know, this is kind of advertising the, the male uh, health and how well nourished he is the color. Uh, another brightly colored finch in our area is the goldfinch. Uh, and here you can see it's a uh, bright uh, yellow uh, color, uh, although the females are not quite as brightly colored. And you'll see I have a female goldfinch in, um, in a minute. And so uh, once again, uh, these birds with their thicker bills uh, are better able uh, uh, to feed on seeds and thus more likely to find uh, their uh, food sources uh, when insects have gone, uh, when a uh, summer ends. So here in this next uh, section of the video, you'll, you'll be able to see the difference between the, uh, the male and the female um, uh, in color. So here's the male 
and then here's uh, the uh, theme. Uh, so there are other uh, finches uh, which uh, live in our area, and also in this group uh, are things uh, known as uh, siskins uh, and others. So here we see a pine uh, a siskin uh, feeding on uh, seeds. So here we see uh, a siskin. Um, an indigo bunting uh, is a very colorful member of uh, this uh, group with its bright uh, blue uh, color. Once again, this tends to be more of a forest bird. And so uh, one of the things one observes with wildlife is that uh, they are adapted to different uh, habitats and food sources. And so if you were to go to say an open field, the birds that you might expect to see would be different than you, those that you would expect to see in a deep uh, forest, et cetera. And so indigo buntings, uh, they tend to be more of uh, a more of a forest uh, bird. Notice the thicker bill uh, there. And also you can notice the thick bill on the, um, on the rose-breasted grosbeak uh, in uh, this video. They're larger than most uh, members of the group. They have a thick bill and notice once again, the bright uh, red patch on uh, their chest. Uh, and so they aren't uh, quite as common as many of the other uh, finches in uh, our uh, area, finches and their uh, allies. Um, and if you get a, a look, uh, the bill is uh, thicker, so they are very good at uh, eating um, at eating seeds. Um, sparrows uh, are uh, varied in our uh, area, uh, and so there are a number of sparrows which are native, um, but then there's also the introduced uh, house uh, sparrow. So uh, song sparrows are quite musical, and so while sparrows quite aren't often as brightly colored, um, nevertheless, you know, they can uh, make uh, a variety of songs. And so, you know, birders are often uh, interested in, you know, uh, the songs of uh, the sparrows. Um, here you see a chipping uh, sparrow, uh, which has a, a bright a rufous patch on, uh, uh, on its head. And there are others, there are tree swall uh, sparrows and uh, swamp uh, sparrows uh, and others. Uh, some have white bands on uh, their head, which make them uh, more noticeable. Finally, there is one last group of birds in our area called the warblers. And the warblers are a favorite of bird watchers in general. As you can see here and in the subsequent videos, there are a variety of species and they are often very colorful. Now, much of this coloration is what is observed in uh, the males during breeding season. So uh, females in general and uh, warblers in autumn often do not have these uh, bright colors. Um, but uh, because of the great diversity of species, uh, you know, birders often, uh, you know, uh, look for them and try to recognize their songs. So they all have very distinctive songs. So, you know, a bird watcher might, you know, try to learn on oh, the yellow warbler, which you see here, makes a song that sounds like sweet, 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 I'm so sweet, or has that cadence. Um, whereas a, um, a yellow um, throat uh, might make a song that sounds like witchity, witchity, witch. Uh, you know, one like a prairie warbler makes a, a song that continually rises in pitch, et cetera. And so, you know, if you were trying to get to know warbler diversity in your area, you, know, you would probably not only be studying the color pa uh, patterns, um, but then listening to the songs as well. And once again, these songs and coloration patterns are very useful because now there are many warbler species that live in the same area. And if they uh, tried to reproduce with different species, then the offspring would probably suffer. But now females uh, know exactly um, which, um, uh, which males belong to their uh, group. The American red star, uh, it's, it's colorful with its black and orange, um, and it's more of a woods bird. And so uh, it would, you know, inhabit tops of trees. And so perhaps your best chance of seeing it is in early spring before the, the leaves uh, truly, uh, you know, start uh, to come out in foliage, uh, come out in their foliage. Um, as you look at these warblers, you'll see that they're, they're frequently moving around. Um, one of many, you know, things is that they are hunting insects. So uh, these small birds are going among the branches uh, and are able then to uh, get lots of uh, the insects which are found 
uh, in uh, trees. While red starts would be found more in uh, a forest environment, yellow warblers are typically found near water. So if there are uh, bushes along a side of a lake or a stream, uh, that's you know, typically where you would uh, see uh, these uh, yellow warblers. Uh, and uh, once again, this is one of the more common uh, warblers in our uh, area. And the same would also be true of uh, the yellow throat, which has a black mask uh, that makes it easily recognizable. Um, it also tends uh, to be found uh, near uh, water uh, primarily. And so these are important in uh, food chains where they prey on uh, insects. And uh, a point that I'll be making uh, throughout uh, this treatment of warblers uh, is that uh, we are concerned about all bird uh, populations, um, but uh, warblers um, uh, particularly uh, because uh, their numbers uh, have been decreasing. Uh, now, uh, one of the problems that uh, birds face is that they need habitat in multiple areas. So, you know, some live in our area all summer. Um, so, you know, we serve as their summer habitat. Um, but they don't live here in the winter, so now they need uh, habitat somewhere else, uh, say in Georgia or Florida or even in Latin America, Venezuela, Brazil. Um, and that's their winter habitat, and they need habitat all along their range. This warbler is called the chestnut-sided warbler, and you can see the chestnut bar along its side. Um, and so, therefore, uh, uh, obviously, the loss of habitat affects it all throughout its uh, range. Also, another uh, problem that uh, warblers are facing, this next one is a black-throated uh, blue uh, warbler. So a very attractive bird, you know, blue with a black uh, face and, um, and uh, chest. Um, another thing that faces them is they time their migrations so that uh, as insects are reclosing uh, from eggs and are small, uh, they uh, can use this as a food source, uh, you know, when they come into our area to lay their uh, eggs or um, uh, as uh, they're migrating further on their migration route. Um, the problem is with climate change, the a time at which the leaves come out on the trees change. And this then influences the time in which insects hatch from eggs. And so if birds are trying to time their migration to you know, hit the insect life cycle at you know, the, the uh, proper moment, if insects are changing um, when they hatch from their uh, eggs, then this obviously is affecting warblers, which might be coming you know, too late and therefore getting less nutrition along their migration, which would mean you know, fewer eggs, fewer resources for the eggs, fewer you know, resources to fly with. There's a black and white uh, uh, warbler. And so we're worried about these, particularly what are called the neotropical migrants. So if climate change is warming North America, um, there is then the hope that not only you know, would the birds that are going to summer in say New York, you know, would this affect them and the plants and the insects? But if they're wintering in Georgia, that Georgia would also be warming and that they would then um, be aware of this and, and, and match and maybe change their migration time. However, if birds are, my, are uh, wintering in Mexico or Venezuela or Brazil, they would have less of a signal of a warming uh, winter and an early spring in North America. And so thus they would be less likely to time, uh, you know, change the timing of their uh, migration. Um, some uh, warblers only come through this area, such as the yellow rumped warbler. It's common in spring, but it doesn't stay through summer. It would be migrating uh, through our uh, area and spending its summer uh, farther north uh, of us. And so, uh, you know, our area uh, would be important for the habitat of, you know, our summer birds, but also is the migratory habitat of these yellow rumped warblers, which have yellow spots along the sides of their body and also on their rump. Um, so notice here that this is an autumn bird. Obviously, the color uh, of the leaves uh, shows that, but notice they're not quite as brightly colored. Many uh, warblers uh, are more brightly colored in uh, spring because that is around mating uh, a season and less so uh, more camouflage in, 
uh, in autumn. Um, Golden-winged warblers are in our area. And actually, they're closely in, uh, related enough to a, uh, a related species, the blue-winged warbler, that in nature one can sometimes observe the hybrid offspring uh, between uh, the two. All right? And so uh, we have both uh, golden-winged warblers uh, and uh, blue-winged uh, warblers. Uh, this next warbler with uh, the black uh, around its yellow face is known as the uh, hooded uh, warbler for obvious uh, region, uh, reasons. So note, you know, that why bird, or, bird watchers, you know, find these, you know, birds, uh, you know, so wonderful to study because although they're small, nevertheless, they have very distinctive uh, coloration uh, patterns and an area can have, you know, dozens of species of warblers. And so, you know, the same area supports this diversity. And so, you know, they must be splitting up habitat, you know, in different areas with, you know, some, you know, feeding on different food sources or preferring more wetland habitats versus um, uh, forested habitats, etc. Um, there are some warblers which are not as brightly colored, um, such as the oven bird, um, but oven birds make a very distinctive call. And so, you know, sometimes that's a trade-off that, you know, less visually uh, obvious, um, but then uh, make a more a common call. Their uh, call, uh, you know, sounds like uh, the cadence, teacher, teacher, teach. Teacher, teacher, teach. So. Results in their more frequently heard than seen. So that would be the call then of uh, the oven bird. And there are a few other warblers, um, uh, which also uh, that would be true of like uh, some which are known as water thrushes, like the Louisiana water thrush. Uh, here's a black-throated uh, green uh, warbler. I often found a bit more with habitats with conifer uh, trees. So once again, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, an area can support so many different species is that they partition habitat. Uh, and so the reason for, um, uh, you know, going through this is we are living in a time in which um, so many species are dwindling and even becoming extinct that we think it's tied for the second worst extinction in the history of vertebrates. I mean, so we're living through a, a tragic time for biodiversity on Earth. And while um, it is certainly you know, admirable to be concerned and perhaps even to try to take actions which help, you know, those which live in rainforests of Brazil or Zaire or endangered species like elephants and rhinos and pandas and polar bears, et cetera. Um, one has the greatest ability uh, to affect those in, you know, one's local area. One of the problems is, I, I think it's fair to say that a lot of people don't necessarily have a good understanding of the biodiversity in their area. And so this area of, you know, uh, the Northeastern United States and Orange County and surrounding areas, it has a wondrous biodiversity as I'm covering through these videos. Some such as this palm wad, uh, warbler are only here during certain times of the year, such as uh, their migration uh, times. Others are here in the summer, others are here in the winter. But if there is going to be hope for this biodiversity, um, then clearly it's through our actions. You know, I, you know, in other videos have, have gone through where, you know, bald eagles and peregrine falcons and, and many other birds, their numbers have increased. And, you know, the, the serious plight they were facing has largely been addressed because of, you know, human uh, conservation and action. And the same then would apply to all of these other uh, species. And so uh, this was to encourage you know, uh, you know, my students and others who live in this area to get to know the wildlife of, you know, their area with the idea that it's our decisions uh, which affect their conservation and hopefully uh, can help um, preserve them for future generations. 